Alex, welcome back to Waterstones. Thank you, Will. It's great to be here. Great to see you too. I meant to look actually to see how many years ago it was, but you, you came in to film a shelfie video with me yeah. for your first novel, The Silent Patient. It was many years ago. It's about six years ago. Six then. years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now we're back to talk about The Fury. I remember with The Silent Patient, you mentioned it was a sort of an update of the myth of Alcestis, is That's that right? That's right, yes, yes. Is there any Greek mythological things that we should be keeping an eye out for in the Fury? There is a goddess. I'd like to weave in a bit of Greek mythology, if I can. Um, it's also because it's set in Greece on a, on a, a small private Greek island that it, I made up. Um, and so I wanted to kind of weave in a bit of mythology too. Um, there's a goddess of the wind, because the wind is central to the novel, because um, I don't know how well you know the Greek islands, but they, they're plagued by wind. Um, and I think I got the germ of the idea about 20 years ago, and I was stranded on an island for three days because the wind was too strong for a boat to leave. Oh, right. And I remember thinking at the time, well, that's a great place, it's a great way of keeping people on an island. Um, yeah. So I wanted to weave in, you know, the, the wind and then put, um, kind of personify the wind um, with this, this Greek goddess. But it's, um, it's less of, a, less of a, a, a strong strain as it has been in my two previous novels, I think. But it's always going to be there for me because it's where I get my ideas from. Yeah, really. I have not had the pleasure of going to a Greek island, I'm afraid. But I have to say that reading this book, I was constantly, it was a very sort of sensual thing, if that makes sense. I found myself wanting to be in that hot sun, uh, feel the wind, eat the food that you were talking about, drink the cocktails that were mentioned. How do you go about incorporating that stuff and making it really live? Or is it just simply a question of, of you sharing your own enthusiasm for those things? It was it was very much a deliberate choice. I think you know I, I to be honest with you, I didn't have a very good time writing my second book. Um, I I think the subject matter I chose was really depressing and sad, and I lived with that for three years. And and I didn't I didn't really want to replicate that experience. And I wanted to try and write something more fun, and more upbeat. Um, and I, I had a conversation with David Baldacci a couple of years ago, and and I asked him at the end how he chooses what book to write next. Mm. And he said to me, you've got to choose something that is still going to interest you in two years' time. And I thought, well, that's such great advice. And so this time I kind of went back to, I suppose the origin was like films I love, like All About Eve or, you know, any Billy Wilder film or Laura or stuff where I love like golden age Hollywood, sophisticated, witty repartee, nice clothes, cocktails, cigarettes. And I thought it would be fun to set a murder in with around people like that. Um, and so I... I kind of used my experience of, of like, because I used to be a screenwriter, and mm. so I, I lived in Hollywood, and I know a lot of actors and, and writers and, and theatre people too, and I thought, okay, I, can, I, can, I think I can bring that to life with some degree of authenticity. Um, and so it was, it was a delight for me to write, and, I, and it was fun because I did actually have a smile on my face the whole time <laughs> I was writing the book, unlike with The Maidens. Um, yeah, it was, it was a happy choice for me. Yeah. It's really interesting you say that because one of the things I wrote down as I was reading the book was it seems like he's really having fun. So that definitely yeah. comes through in the book. Good. Uh, and I was going to ask about sort of the, the acting and, and slightly theatrical influence of the book. But first of all, I think it'd be really useful if we talk about a couple of the, the main characters. So uh, Lana Farah is your sort of screen goddess, if you like, who mm -hmm. sort of uh, dominates the, the, the plot of the book. Tell me a little bit about creating her. Uh, you mentioned your screenwriting past. Does that mean that there are any actresses that we should be having in mind? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I did see an awful lot of bad behaviour when I was in <laughs> Hollywood. Um, and I did keep my eyes and ears open. And I thought about one day I would kind of use these larger than life characters. And then I, I really loved the idea of trapping them on a Greek island and then throwing in a murder. I thought it'd be really fun. Um, yeah, Lana is an ex-movie star, and she owns this private island in Greece where she invites her best friends to join her for Easter, and then they get trapped there, and there's a murder. Um, I, you know, or the honest answer is, I suppose, you can see from the dedication of the book, it's dedicated to Uma Thurman. Um, I worked with Uma when I was in Hollywood, and I, uh, we did a film together, and it was um, well-intentioned, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> but it was a disaster from start to finish. Um, and uh, I was writing A Silent Patient at the time, and uh, Uma taught me a lot about visual storytelling. Mm. Um, and it was fascinating learning curve. And I, after that kind of education of working with her, I, I went back to London and I rewrote The Silent Patient completely and, and changed it. And, it, and, it, and it, it finally started to work and my writing started to improve. Um, and we stayed in touch, we're still very good friends. And I, and I um, thought then that I wanted to try and write something for her. Mm. And so she was the inspiration for 
Lana. Yeah. I mean, she's not, not Lana grew into another character, but that's where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. And the novel itself is narrated by Elliot Chase. What can you tell us about him as a character? Because, of course, it's, it's sort of his voice that tells the story. And we were talking earlier about how much fun you were having telling that story. So tell me yeah. a bit about him. Well, you, you know, well, I think the reason that I had fun is because I completely changed the way that I wrote for mm. this novel. So for the first two books, I planned meticulously for a year and a year and a half before I wrote a single word. And this time, I just decided to try and write it without planning. Um, which did, of course, lead me into all kinds of difficulties later on. But um, <laughs> the, what happened was that I, I wrote the first draft in the third person and it just felt lifeless and dead and I just read it and I was so upset with it. And I was just, I was walking along and I just started to recite the opening lines of the book to myself. And I, for the first time, I asked myself who, who might be talking. Mm. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if it's Elliot who was... In the first draft, a very minor role, a kind of supporting comic relief character, a British playwright. Um, and I thought, oh, it'd be really fun if a bit like George Sanders in All About Eve, mm. you know, or I can't remember the name now in Laura, the, the, um, the playwright, but uh, the, that kind of sophisticated, witty, fun observer, a wry narrator. Mm. Um, and I, I thought, oh, that would be a really good way in. And it, then when I then rewrote the whole book with him telling us a story, and because I hadn't really plotted it carefully, he changed everything. Um, right. And that's why it was the most kind of, kind of creative experience I've, I've ever had because um, I'm a bit of a control freak when I'm a writer and I think it actually it has harmed my writing because I think the stuff that came out of the, the spontaneity this time were, mm. were wonderful. Like um, all of his backstory, all of his childhood, his relationship with this older writer called Barbara West just appeared fully formed as I was just tapping away and I hadn't given it any thought or plan. Even the name just appeared. It was all... So it felt like a really joyous experience, and um, and I I liked having a narrator with a sense of humour. Mm. That really helped for me. Yeah. Given that experience with the maidens and, and the writing of that, and then the fun that you have with that, do, do you think that might change how you approach writing, for example, the next books? That you would be less control freaky, as you say, less planning beforehand, and more sort of seeing where the writing takes you. Yeah, I think a sense of play is going to come into it. I think you know what. So what happened again with this book is when I, I wrote the first draft. I gave it to uh, my two editors and my agent to read, and they both said, setup's great, character's great, falls apart in the second half, the twist doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so either you can, because you're only you know, taking six months to say, you can bin this and write something else, or you can rethink it from the beginning. And um, I, I listened to a podcast that saved me by George Saunders, and he said that when a book when that happens and you hit an obstacle, a stumbling block halfway through a novel, mm. he said it's a golden opportunity because it's the novel speaking to you. And it's a novel saying, I refuse to continue under these contrived conditions. So go back to the beginning and find something truthful and authentic and try again. Yeah. And so, and I, I think where I'm going with this is that I didn't panic. That's what I'm taking away from this writing experience because I could have completely panicked at that point. But for some reason, I think because I was having so much fun, Yeah. I didn't, and I just closed the laptop, and I spent a month just walking around the park every day for a couple of hours, just talking to myself, and went right back to the beginning, and then went beat by beat, scene by scene, and then the characters went in a different direction. Mm. Um, and I think that sense of not being tied to something, but being able to improvise and to shift and change is something I'm going to try and learn from. It's interesting you use the word improvise, because that, that, which is a very actory term, yeah. and there, there is a real theatricality to this novel, and in fact, just before we started this conversation, you were talking about some theatre that you're going to watch. And it's yeah. clear that there is this influence in your life from theatre and film. Um, there is this, I guess, a great cast of characters that you unveil, very much like a cast list. And, and I guess the part of that is to do with having a playwright as a narrator. But tell me a little bit about sort of the opportunities, I suppose, that that style and that cast list provides to you as a writer. It all came together nicely, I think. I mean, I've always been in love with theatre and with movie stars since I was a little boy. And I started out as an actor when I left university and I was a really bad actor, like Elliot um, in the book. I was just very self-conscious. And then that led me to writing. Unemployment led me to writing and the rest kind of went from there. But I worked as a screenwriter, like I said. And so I very, feel very at home in that, in that world. Um, and choosing... You know, it's partly related to the genre, or I don't even know what the right word is, um, sub-genre trope of having people trapped on an island, mm. which, you know, obviously um, Christie created with, and then there were none. Mm. And I think every single person who tackles this, she's kind of hovering over you like a spectre. 
but not just over us, but over the writers, also over the readers, because the readers know what to expect mm. from that. And so when someone picks up a book like this, they think they know what they're going to get. They're going to get larger-than-life characters, uh, an island setting, something's going to trap them there, it's going to be a murder, investigation, solution. And so I thought what would be really fun would be to play with these expectations that the reader is bringing mm. and subvert them. And by having a playwright who's very aware of the genre that he's writing in mm. as the narrator, it meant that there could be a little dance between Elliot and, and the reader where he you know, is constantly you know, referring to what we are expecting to happen and also the conventions of genre as well and the conventions of a tragedy and mm. how it all works. And, and all that kind of you know, meta-theatrical aspect was, was really appealing and it fit the characters and it fit the plot because the plot is very much about acting mm. as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it was really fun. As you say, there, there is actually a moment when Elliot says, if this was a conventional sort of whodunit, this is how it could play out. And, yeah. then, he, and then he says, but it's, that's not what happened and that's not how this book is going to kind of work. In, in which case, w what were the themes that you were wanting to explore in the book? Because it isn't a sort of conventional whodunit, it's a very different kind of book. So what, what, a, what one, for example, I thought was this idea of these people being honest and saying that life is just a performance. So this idea of acting and presenting a persona. That's one of the crucial things it felt to me in, in the, yeah. the, these characters. I wonder now, having this conversation with you, whether in fact my writing process fed into that too, because I myself was realising that the story wasn't you know, from going the way that I thought it would with the initial draft, mm. and it went in a different way. And I think there's something about the idea of the, the conclusion Elliot comes to is that you, know, you, you can put real people into a, a pre-designed plot and the plot doesn't work because real people are unpredictable and you don't know how it's going. So it's the kind of divergence between theatre and reality, mm. which I kept, I kept playing with. And I think as a writer, I was playing with that too. Um, but I think the main theme for me really is probably about childhood, as, as it always is, I think, in, in stuff that I write. Um, I, I think it's just, you know, I, I grew up watching films and, and wanting to be in the movies because I was probably quite an anxious, nerdy, weird child. I haven't changed much. And I um, <laughs> ran away to Hollywood thinking that I would be really happy. And then I finally got there and I was just as neurotic and as miserable as I always had been. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I probably need to look at myself a bit. And that which led me on, you know, hugely long journey of therapy, both as a, a patient and then a, a student and working in a psychiatric unit and blah, blah, blah. And that kind of and then finally I had something to say as, as a writer mm. because I, I think I was quite shallow before. Um, and so there's something about that journey which Elliot goes on in The Fury too, which is about you know, learning to communicate with this sort of inner child that we carry mm. around in us as well. Because um, I do think a lot of these characters, in my experience from actors that I've known, um, people are fleeing something because they, it's, they're seeking something in, in all of the applause and in the approval and the adoration. It's because they're fleeing some inner lack they have, which usually it can be traced to their childhood. And so all of these characters are w wounded children, I think, in a way. Ex actor here, not saying any more oh. detail about, <laughs> about what he might be fleeing from his childhood. Um, no. Um, uh, uh, one of the things as well, there's a very direct philosophical question which is, which is sort of asked by Elliot, is this idea of character or fate. Could you explain a little bit about what that means and why it's sort of important to the story? Yeah, um, well, it's it's something I suppose I, I I I did the tragedy paper at university and really got into it because you know growing up in Cyprus, um, you were taught Greek tragedies from a very young age. They don't teach you Shakespeare at school; they teach you Homer and mm. Euripides and stuff. And so I was very immersed in, in Greek tragedy without really fully understanding it, just loving all the stories. And then at university, we began to kind of look at this idea of free will. And fate, mm. and um, it was the uh, philosopher Heraclitus, Heraclitus who said, um, I know it in Greek, but I have to say it in English, um, they, uh, that character is fate, and that just I found really startling. Um, Henry James said the same thing, and Graham Greene twisted it into character is plot, which is just so brilliant, and says the same thing too. Mm. Essentially, it means that you you do what you are, you are what you do. And so a character with a specific personality will act in a certain way, and that is their destiny, um, which is a deeply psychological insight, particularly for ancient Greece. I mean, mm. that's why I think the tragedies are so incredible, because they're, they're pre-psychological, and yet they're deeply psychological, mm. and that they're just amazingly accurate. 
um, which is why we still love them, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to kind of look into that. And for me, the question then became, well, okay, well, if our character decides what we do, what decides our character? Which led me back to psychology and psychotherapy and childhood mm. stuff. You know, Angela Carter said, we are our childhood. Mm. And I, just, I love that line because I think it's deeply true. And so it, all of these, I guess it was just kind of these, these themes that just really interest me kept coming up in the book. So I, I, I thought it was a very rich writing experience for me. The title of the book, The Fury, and, and as you mentioned earlier, this, this connection with the wind, I'm always deeply suspicious of people when they say things like, oh, it's almost like the city is a character in the novel, but the, the, the wind, the, the sort of atmosphere of this book absolutely is crucial to, to the whole sort of enterprise. Is it one of those things that you have to sort of experience, that you have to have been on an island like that and to understand what you're actually talking about? And did you feel, therefore feel a sort of pressure to be able to describe that in the book, to make it clear that it isn't just a device to kind of maroon some people on an island for a few days, but there is something full of character about that? Yeah, experience? well, as the, uh, the reason you know, I called it the, the Fury is because the, the character is called the Wind, the Fury. And the Fury is also you know, relevant to all the heightened emotions that are, are happening as mm -hmm. well on the island, so it felt thematically quite correct. But you know what, that was the easiest part for me to write because I grew up in Cyprus um, and I've been around the Greek islands my whole life. And it was lovely not to have to, like, you know, when I wrote The Maidens, it, part of the reason I wanted to write that book was because I wanted to re-experience um, being in Cambridge. Um, but that involved me going there and doing a massive amount of research and taking notebooks and just walking around and constantly, like, it took six months of photographing and writing and to kind of reproduce it. Mm. Whereas when I was writing The, the Greek Island, it just, I, it, it literally was just, I don't think any of those passages got rewritten it just came out to me because I know it so well mm. so it was really fun to do that um, yeah and the wind as well I mean I took notes a little bit I went to um, Sardinia on holiday and the wind was horrific <laughs> and so I thought oh great this is good so I got my notebook out and, and kind of took notes then but yeah and then we're able to use that for your TripAdvisor review <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this other thing which is quite a subtle thing I think but the this idea of, of menace that can kind of lurk underneath a book like this. And there's a slight thing that I find interesting, which is this idea of these wealthy outsiders, this idea of the private ownership of this Greek island, and then the Greek characters, the native characters, if you like, who, are, who, who have their sort of own ideas, I guess, about who these people are and their attitudes to them. Is, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because it, it was a really nice kind of taste to this book, if you see what I mean, that there was this slight menace underneath in a book where you're thinking who, who might the killer be. There were just so many options mm -hmm. or motivations that could be there. Yeah, I think the, the Greek part was very important to me to make it authentic um, and not just make sort of like token characters that were there for no reason. Mm. Um, the one that was most interesting to me was the caretaker, Nikos, yeah. um, because he wasn't in the first draft. And then I spoke to a Greek friend of mine and I mentioned that I was writing it and I explained what I was writing and she just said, well, who's, who's looking after the island? And I said, well, nobody. They get a cleaner to come and then they arrive. And she's like, you're insane. That would never happen. There needs to be somebody there who's a caretaker. Yeah. And I was really annoyed. You know what it's like when you get a suggestion you don't want to hear when you know it's right because you know it involves work. Um, and so I was annoyed to hear that. But then I went away and thought about this character and what that would be like. Um, and I wrote so much about Nikos that all got cut because it just felt like it wasn't there's a really lovely line Hemingway said once where he said, you know, he would always cut that kind of stuff, his backstories, and he, because he said it's important that I know it. It's not right. important that the reader knows it. And so I, I really went into Nicholas's life and what it would be like and what the experience of being alone on an island for 25 years mm. would do to you. Mm. Um, and the more eccentric he became and what the, the more he identified with the island and I... I, I wrote, you know, I, I wrote a lot of stuff about his walks that I, I cut, you know, where he would knew all the flowers and he knew the names of the plants and everything like that, because I really felt that he would have a relationship with the island. Mm. Um, and Agathe is the other Greek character, and she um, is uh, Lana's assistant and um, best friend, sort of, I think, mm. um, caretaker in a way also. Um, and she, she felt like a very authentic character for me. I wrote her specifically with a Greek actress in mind, um, I should say probably you know that the origins of the story were to write it as a film okay. and so it started out as a paragraph um, as, a, as a blurb that I was just going to you know a pitch um, which I would then put aside and then write a book 
Um, but then it grew into a treatment, and the treatment grew into a short story, and then it grew into a novella. And I thought, well, this is such a useless document. What on earth do I do with this, this novella? And I suddenly thought, well, maybe it could be a novel. I'm having so much fun. Yeah. And so it expanded. But the origins of the idea were very much um, characters that actors could play. And so I had a Greek actress in mind for, for Agathy, and I had Uma Thurman in mind for, for Lana. And so, you know, it became that kind of... It's very much like an actor's piece, mm. I, I suppose, which again fed into the theatricality. I have to ask now whether there is any hope that it might develop into that kind of project, or is it strictly a novel for now? No, it's. Um, I, I can't talk about it too much, but yes, it, it is. Hopefully, I mean, there is a producer attached and a screenplay being written, and so it should be a film. I hope that's very exciting. But you know, these things they, they yep. <laughs> take a hundred years if, <laughs> if they ever happen. But I'm excited. Yeah, we will not hold our breath. Uh, we'll just keep fingers crossed. It's really interesting you said that actually about the doing all of that work for those characters and then cutting it. But the work is evident in the book because both those characters feel very fleshed out and interesting rather than just kind of ciphers for something. That's quite and, I, and I think that feeds into, as I say, that sort of sense of unease because they're very much watching what's going on with this knowledge, in Nikos's case, of the island and the place they are, and then Agathy's case, knowing Lana so well as a person because she spent so much time. Yeah. And then there's that emotional attachment yeah. that she has to her, which yeah. obviously is very important. We could talk for yeah. much longer about uh, all of these uh, aspects of character, but it's, as I say, a really fascinating read, a very enjoyable read, and great to hear how much fun it was for you to write um, with the sort of experience of, of the writing the previous book. Does that mean that you are already into the thick of your next writing project, or are you just going to enjoy the fury for now? No, I'm, I've already planned it. I'm about to go on tour in the US, so I'm going to lose a big chunk of time, and I... Um, I'm really excited about the next book. I think what I'm, you know, it's what you said about the characters is, is super nice because I think that's what I want to try and do. I think what I aspire to be is like someone like Ruth Rendell. You know, I'll never be as good as her, but she writes books, novels that are also detective stories, but also, also novels with real living, breathing characters. Mm. And that's something I really wanted to develop in the next book and really try and have a, a, a book that is a, a genre book, but also stands on its own feet as a, as a character story too. So. I'm working hard on that right now, yeah. Well, as I said to you before, you made me want to drink cocktails and eat amazing Mediterranean food when I was reading the book, so I suggest we go and do something like that. I, I think that's great, yeah. <laughs> I, want to, I want to try that cocktail you were telling me about. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much. Thank you, Will. Thank you.